<clears throat> For those of you who are in our time zone today, welcome to the best day of the week. Always love Sunday. It's a, a day for us to both always be grateful and, and be thankful for, for so many things. <clears throat> for those who are listening at home, if you would get a sheet of paper, there's a couple of things that I'd like to have you to write down, which will help you to kind of follow the flow of what we're going to do. After, after the book of Malachi closes, there are 400 years of silence. And how does God break the silence? He sends Gabriel to Zechariah, who's in the temple, and telling him that as an old couple, like Abraham and Sarah, they're going to have a son. <clears throat> Gabriel, E.L., God is strong, God is mighty, and God breaks 400 years of silence with the voice of an angel. Both in Isaiah and Malachi, it's predicted that there will be a voice crying in the wilderness. And God is going to introduce <clears throat> the coming of Jesus and the coming of the kingdom with a voice. <clears throat> One of our young mothers at Eastside a few years ago had a daughter who was fussing. And she said, I took her outside happened to be standing under one of the speakers, and she heard your voice and just immediately went to sleep. <laughs> I told her, I'm, I'm multi-talented, it's not just babies. I can do it with teenagers, I can do it with older people, give them that just ease things out. But you stop and think, for 17 years you have heard the voice of Tim Lewis when it comes to preaching the word. And so God chose a man who in many ways was very eccentric and very odd to be the voice crying in the wilderness. <clears throat> We're going to cover quite a bit of ground in a different way today, and hopefully this will, will help to make sense as we go through this. We're going to actually go into Acts 18 and 19. <clears throat> But for those who have that outline, just look down at 1-3. And if you're at home, I want you just to write down a couple of passages in the book of Acts just to give us some chronology. And there's two reasons for this. John is going to be involved in this. Secondly, Lord willing, next year, <clears throat> we'll be studying through the book of Acts. But this will tie back into John. So first of all, in Acts 2, obviously, is Pentecost, and this church starts. <clears throat> and an easy memory point to remember, Acts 10, the conversion of Cornelius, is a decade later. So we're going to preach the kingdom, preach the church. God's going to add to their number in Acts 2. And then when we come to Acts chapter 10 and the first Gentile is added, then that's going to be Cornelius. Today we're going to look at something in Acts 18, and as we're going to find, that's another decade later, that's going to be between 49 and 50, and we'll explain this here in a second. And then when we come from Acts 18 to Acts 28, at the end, we're at 61. And what I want you to see is that in the book of Acts, we have three decades of the spread and the growth of the church. Okay, real quick, Pentecost, 10 years later is Cornelius in Acts 10. As we're going to see, we're about 10 years later today. We're going to look at something in Acts 18 and 19. And then when Paul is in prison in Acts 28, <clears throat> we're probably at 61, 62. And it just strikes me as interesting that Luke is going to give us the gospel of Jesus, which is going to take roughly three years, and then he's going to give us snapshots of the development and the growth of the early church over the next 30 years. <clears throat> I 
We're going to look at Acts 18.24. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man and competent in the scriptures. He knew only the baptism of John. I grew up hearing them called Priscilla and Aquila. I've heard more precise people call them Priscilla and Aquila, which I don't know who those people are. I know who Priscilla and Aquila are. And so here this couple find a very educated man named Apollos, and they take him aside because, and this is what's significant, 20 years after the cross, Apollos only knows the baptism of John. We'll fill that in, but just kind of let that start processing. 20 years after the cross, Apollos is running around the Roman Empire, and he has not heard that Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead. He only knows the baptism of John. So they explained the word of God more accurately to him. He wished to cross to Achaia, and Achaia is the Roman name for Greece where uh, Corinth is. And he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. What's significant is that outside of Athens, uh, Alexandria in Egypt was the most um, learned, educated city in the Roman Empire. Um, It's estimated that before the Great Fire, and and think about this, there were 700,000 scrolls in the Alexandrian Library. Can you imagine how many buildings it would take to house 700,000 scrolls? So Alexandria was one of these major, major cities in the Roman Empire. And then here's Apollos, and he's going to come from one of the most educated, populated places in the Eastern Roman Empire. And he comes to Ephesus, and Ephesus is going to be the major center in Western Asia Minor. <clears throat> and this is what's important for us. Before TV, before radio, then we're going to have a two decade span where a very educated man in major population centers still only knows the baptism of John. <clears throat> you may not want to do this now, but if you write in your New Testaments, here's two things I would like for you to add. The first one, and we're at 1 1 in the center if you have the outline. Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, and Claudius is going to be the emperor from 41 to 54. So we're going to go Augustus, Tiberius. We typically call Caligula, he's kind of the nutcase. And then Claudius is going to be emperor from 41 to 54. But Claudius had commanded the Jews to leave Rome. It didn't matter if you were a Christian Jew. It didn't matter what you were. If you were a Jew, you're out of here. And so from Roman history, we know that this event in the book of Acts takes place in 49 AD. And so there's going to be two very clear dates in the book of Acts, and this is one of them. And when you start figuring out the dates of when things happen, then Aquila and Priscilla are going to be, can I say, kicked out of Rome with the decree of the emperor. I think this is also the background for the writing of the book of Romans, which is going to be probably 55 to 56, six or seven years later. uh, Jews start coming back into Rome And we've had a church that was multicultural in every aspect because you're at the center of the Roman Empire. And then for five or six years, all of the Jews are forced to leave, not of their own choice. The emperor says, you're out. And the book of Romans is how does a multicultural church become multicultural again? And let me try to say this tactfully. For those of us who may have been Gentiles, It was nice being able to have bacon in our baked beans and no one complain. And then we have the two groups trying to come back together. 
and that to me is a, the heart of the book of Romans, is everyone who believes in the name of the Lord will be saved, but it's a challenge to bring people from all different cultures together. And as we mentioned, within a short time of starting the church in Campbelltown, uh, we had people from 20 nations in a church of less than 100. And you just stop and think, what is a potluck going to be like when you have people from 20 different nations bringing, bringing food with you? It gives a whole new meaning to what Paul says. Uh, eat what is put before you without asking questions. Because sometimes you may not want to know what everything is just because of the diversity of what different people eat around the world. The second thing is also in Acts 18, and it's verse 12. Gallio is proconsul of Achaia. And an inscription has been found that has the date of July 51. Now, I'm not saying that this is what happens here in the book of Acts, but listen to the word proconsul. Julius Caesar is going to be assassinated in 44 BC because he had acquired too much power and brought too much just in one person, and he was assassinated. <clears throat> He, we know him as Augustus, but originally um, <clears throat> he's a young man. And as Octavian begins to rise in power at a point in time, he divides the Roman Empire between the Senate and who we now call the emperor. And so, for example, Alexandria, which is the breadbasket of the Roman Empire, Augustus wants to control Alexandria. <clears throat> Because if there's a famine in the Roman Empire, as we're going to read in the book of Acts, he can help feed places lacking food if he owns the breadbasket. He also wants to control Palestine because up to the north are the Parthians, and the Romans never did totally defeat the Parthians. And if we need to rush legions to protect Egypt, well, we can sacrifice Palestine. So Palestine was a buffer zone, and so the, the ruling people, if you're under Augustus, you're going to be either a prefect or a governor, as in Pilate. If you are under an area controlled by the Senate, you are a proconsul, which means you are a senior member of the Senate, and so here is a senior citizen. It would be like years ago, us sending Robert Kennedy or someone like that um, <clears throat> to England to be our ambassador. He's been in the Senate so long he wouldn't need a blue book to tell him what to do, what goes on in the government. And so here is Gallio, is proconsul, but what is significant is that you don't want to leave any of these guys there too long. <laughs> They're rotated fairly quickly so they don't get too much power and gain too much influence. And so these two dates, 49 when Claudius expels the Jews, and then 51, when Gallio is proconsul of Achaia, then they're going to help us to date the events in the book of Acts. But again, here's what's significant. Apollos, 20 years later, hasn't heard of the cross. And then I want us to look at, <clears throat> if you go to the, to the second page or the back page, if you have that. <clears throat> I just asked this question. If Apollos had ran up to the Ethiopian in the chariot and opened his mouth and taught him from Isaiah, guess what he would have taught him? The baptism of John. That's what he knew. Here's the second part of this that is important in chapter 19 of Acts. While Apollos is in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, uh, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And so you keep reading in Acts 19. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And the reason we've started with this is that here now are 12 men in Ephesus 20 years later that we have our second case of people who know the baptism of John 
and haven't heard about the cross and the resurrection yet. Paul's going to teach them, baptize them, lay hands on them. They will receive the Holy Spirit. And so there's 12 men in all. Here's a question, and you don't have to agree with me for us to have difficulty, but just think about this. If, if this is the cross, do we have a record of anyone who was baptized into the baptism of John before the cross who were rebaptized afterwards? And I'm simply going to say, if they were, we don't have a record of it. I believe, and, and obviously open to, to reading and, and discussion, but I believe if you were baptized into the baptism of John, he's going to say, repent for what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he preached a baptism for the forgiveness of what? Sins. Now, growing up, you may have heard those wonderful lessons like I did, that the blood of cross goes both the blood of Jesus goes both ways from the cross. Abraham, David, I believe the disciples of John, etc., are then added into the kingdom. And you'll find, I think it's in Luke 7, that the Pharisees had rejected the purpose of God for themselves because they had not been baptized in the baptism of John, but the tax collectors had. And then here's the other thing that just strikes me as interesting. Do you remember in Acts 2, there were added to their what? Their number, 3,000 souls. I think there were 3,000 people baptized on the day of Pentecost that had not been baptized into the baptism of John. This is an area of speculation, but just invite you to think about this. I, I had never thought about this, but in a New Testament survey class with Bill McCord, he said, I believe these 12 men were baptized into the baptism of John after the cross. You do the best you can with what you know. Okay, that's, we all do that. <clears throat> and we have record here of Apollos, who is even from Egypt, 12 men in Ephesus, and that's why I wanted you to have the dates today, two decades after the cross, who have not heard of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but they know the baptism of John. I just find that very interesting. And in a world where with TV and radio and things, well, that's not totally true. Bless their hearts. Um, <laughs> years after World War II, they occasionally would come across a Japanese soldier on an island stranded somewhere in the Pacific that didn't know the, world, the war was over. Greg, wouldn't that be disheartening to be on an island, I don't know how long it was, five, seven, or 10 years later, and because you're stranded there, you don't know. Look at how much the world has changed by the time you go back home. <clears throat> so in our day and age, I think it's, that's why I wanted to start with this. It's helpful to see that news is not going to travel quickly, and the spread of the gospel is going to continue throughout that particular period of time. And <clears throat> this is my question. There's a dotted line how many other disciples of John are in Western Asia Minor that get taught the gospel when Paul is in Ephesus? So we have two examples, and I'm sure there were others, of people who scattered throughout the Roman Empire only knew the baptism of John. If you go to a tour of ancient Ephesus today, um, a lot is said about the apostle John lived here. And there is even a place where they say this is where Mary lived. Do you remember on the cross? What does Jesus say? Behold your mother, behold your son. And if this is Ephesus, you go down the coast of Turkey and the Isle of Patmos is off here. And so it's, it's not outside of reason that some of the first readers of the Gospel of John may have been in the area of Ephesus in Western Asia Minor. So this is number four. When you come to the Gospel of John, and we're going to backtrack here in just a second, John the Baptist has one purpose. He's a witness. He just, he, he's come for one purpose. 
We don't hear anything, as Luke tells us, about uh, Zechariah being spoken to by Gabriel. We don't hear anything about Mary and Elizabeth. We don't hear <clears throat> anything about his birth and early life. We're just going to be introduced to this voice crying in the wilderness. I wonder if it's to help both instruct and to teach and to, can I say, strengthen people who originally were disciples of John because, as we're going to see, a part of John being the voice cried in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord is that in the early chapter of John, he's going uh, to point these early disciples and he's going to say, see that one? It, that's the Lamb of God. And the earliest followers of Jesus, first of all, were disciples of John. I'm sure you also heard lessons, as I did. Remember, Jesus is walking by the seashore. They're in their nets, and they've never seen him before type thing. And he says, you know, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And just mysteriously, they leave their nets and leave everything and follow him. Well, John tells us prior to that, John the Baptist has said, oh, there's the Lamb of God. They have gone and spent time with him. Andrew goes and gets his brother Peter. Oh, we have, we have found the Messiah. And so to me, it makes a lot more sense for these guys to drop their nets and follow him. This isn't the first time they've seen him. They started as disciples of John, and John, as preparing the way of the Lord, then points these earliest disciples to Jesus. And as you learn that 20 or 30 years later, if you are still a disciple of John, you can say, okay, well, this is why John came, to point people to Jesus. And so, repeat, but look at number six, John 1, 6 through 8, he came as a witness. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Isn't that just an eloquent passage? A man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all may believe in him. He was not the light. He came to bear witness to the light. And so this voice crying in the wilderness is going to repeatedly say, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you have the outline on the, the second page, and again, we'll do this quickly. When we were walking through the Old Testament, I just love this expression that in the same way that we came in this auditorium by hinges on doors that open a door, when I read through the Old Testament and I come to Samuel, Samuel is a hinge in that things are never going to be the same after Samuel. El asked of God, and what do we find in 1 Samuel? Then Samuel anoints the first king, and he's going to anoint Saul, and the politics, the rule of Israel is never going to be the same as it was before. And then before he dies in 2 Samuel, then Samuel anoints the young boy David to become the king. And the idea of the anointed one in the Old Testament is the physical king. What we're going to happen in the New Testament is that in the same way, we have this 400 years of silence broken by Gabriel speaking to John's father. And then John the Baptist, to my mind, is the hinge between the end of the Old Testament and the ministry of Jesus because things are never going to be the same. Their message is going to be very similar. And what is it? Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. God is about to rule in human life. God is about to rule in our hearts in a totally new way. And so when I think of John the Baptist, the voice crying in the wilderness, I think in the same way that Samuel was the hinge, the change agent for the whole of the Old Testament, then by the time you come to this 400 intertestament into the Gospels, then John is going to be the hinge that's there. If you're at home and just taking a note, we're going to be reading some things from the book of Malachi. And so again, we're kind of splitting between the old and the new. And if you'll notice, Malachi closes our Old Testament with the prediction that one is coming like Elijah. And, you know, Elijah, very kind of 
And I use the word rough and crude, not in a negative way, but, but uh, uh, Elijah would never make a politician. <laughs> he was too, too direct and too, too much involved in, in speaking the word of the Lord. And Malachi 3 and 1 says, I will send my messenger and he will prepare my way for me. I'm confident that Malachi had no idea that when he finishes, there's going to be 400 years of silence. But just before God closes the curtain on the Old Testament, then here comes this prediction, this prophecy, I'm going to send a messenger. And then notice when we come to, to the, and we're literally we're at the very end, and notice this, I will send to you Elijah the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And what will Elijah do? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a curse. And so just before the curtain drops at the end of the Old Testament, then we get this echo, we get this something to look forward to. I'm sending a messenger and he's going to be like Elijah. So now we're going to read from Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. There appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. <laughs> this to me is an understatement. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. <laughs> if you're in the temple offering sacrifices and burning incense and an angel drops in on you, I think troubled is, is, is a good start. I, I would probably be terrified. He doesn't understand all the significance of it, but he knows he was in there by himself. And now the angel is with him. Do not be afraid. And that's one of the most repeated words of messengers of God throughout the whole Bible. Don't be afraid. And what does he say to him? Your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're going to call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great before the Lord. And in this sense, he's like the Nazarites in the Old Testament. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And listen to the echo from Malachi. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of who? Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom and to make ready a people for the Lord, a people prepared. Do you hear the echo? As the curtain drops on the end of the Old Testament, a messenger's coming. There will be one like Elijah. He's going to turn the hearts of children to their father. As soon as God opens the New Testament, he sends Gabriel and he gives a direct quote to Zechariah back to what Malachi closes the Old Testament with and says, this son, who you're going to call John, is going to be in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Then when you come to Luke 1, of what will this child be? A prophet of the Most High. He will go before the Lord to prepare his ways and to give knowledge of the salvation and then here's this wonderful passage in Luke 1, 80. Uh, the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. And we're going to hear Samuel as a young man. Yes, he's going to grow up in the tabernacle with Eli. And the little boy Samuel grew in spirit and in strength. We're told the same thing about Elijah. And then there's that wonderful passage in Luke 2, 52 about our Lord. So John is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will have the power of Elijah. And his message is going to be repent and be baptized. The voice crying in the wilderness. Now, we're in Luke 3, verse 1. And here is the single most concentration of leaders in Roman history in all of the New Testament. And as we said, Luke does something similar for us in, Luke 18, in Acts 18 and 19. But it's going to be the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. And Tiberius is going to be emperor from 14 to 37. P 
Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. Oh, when you hear governor, he's going to answer to Pilate. He's not a proconsul. And Pilate is going to rule from 26 to 36. And then Herod is tetrarch of Galilee, Philip tetrarch of Atyria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene during the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so I'm going to read a passage, and it's on the, the back of that page. And this is from the book of Isaiah, which is going to be 700 years before Jesus. And listen to what Isaiah says. <clears throat> the voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And he talks about valleys and mountains, and the crooked will become straight. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. And so in the ministry of John the Baptist, the voice crying in the wilderness, and there are others, but I've just chosen these two. One, we have a passage from Isaiah 700 years later that is going to describe someone who's going to be a voice crying in the wilderness. And when we open the New Testament and read the book of Luke, we find out, aha, John the Baptist. Malachi, 400 years before the end of the Old Testament, at the end of the Old Testament, 400 years before John, then talks about one's going to come in the spirit and the power of Elijah to, to turn people back. And so people are going to ask, what shall we do? Questions asked to John. And so... To the crowds, share your tunics, share your clothes, share your food. Tax collectors, do not collect more than you're authorized to. Soldiers, do not extort. And people keep asking John, are you the Messiah? <clears throat> and remember these two words, very significant. Our word Jesus, I think of as his personal name. And in Matthew 1, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So when I hear the word Jesus, I hear the word Savior. The word Christ is the word either Messiah, but literally with my hand, I oftentimes when I hear the word Christ, I think of the anointed one. And <laughs> how ironic, and we mentioned about this in an earlier context, it, it's so appropriate that someone like Samuel, and I'm trying to give a sense of uprightness and godliness and the last of the, of the prophets before the kings in that sense, and, or the last of the judges and the earliest prophet, how appropriate to send asked of God is his name to anoint Saul and to anoint David. Who anoints Jesus? If he knew what kind of woman this was, <laughs> he wouldn't let her touch him. Do you see the irony in that? God brings one of the great godly men of the Old Testament to anoint the earthly kings. And ladies, don't get offended. Don't, Australians have this lovely expression, don't get a knot in your knickers when I say this. But physically, Jesus is only anointed by women. And I think how appropriate. And even the lady of the night with her tears. And then I have really ticklish feet. And if anybody tried to, to dry my feet with her hair, I would just come out of my skin. But that's how the Pharisees felt because of who she was. And the idea that Jesus would recline and allow her to wash his feet with her tears, they just they couldn't stand that. And so John says... I'm not able to undo the straps of his sandals. He preached good news. And if you look at the very bottom, those who are least in the kingdom are greater than John. There's a lot of verses on the next page that I'll leave you to read. And when you come to the Gospel of John, you're going to hear witness, 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 testify. And notice these words. The word witness is a noun, is used 14 times in John. To testify, which is the verb is used 33 times, and the word testimony is used 14. Dear friend Charlie Powell in Britain Road across the lake 
Uh, he a lot of times teaches people the gospel from John and says, here's a court scene and we're going to bring people to testify. And that's what happens all through. The testimony of John the Baptist is, I'm not the Messiah, I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. And you can read through whether he's talking about the Lamb of God, pointing people to Jesus, the first disciples, all of his ministry, John is going to point people to Jesus. <clears throat> If you have the back page, there's two or three things that we'll close with today. For the voice crying in the wilderness, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then I love this statement where he looks at Jesus and points his disciples to him and he says, you know, the Lamb of God, and what's the Lamb of God going to do? The Lamb of God is going to take away the sins of the world. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus is crucified during the Passover, where for 1,500 years they have been offering Passover lambs on that weekend. And as they are killing lambs in the temple to prepare for the Passover meal, the Lamb of God is hanging on a cross outside of Jerusalem. And Sheila and I have been talking the last couple of weeks about uh, the three hours of darkness. Um, there's this times I've just cried over that. Uh, the light of the world. God says, let there be light. God speaks. Jesus brings it into the world. God says, let there be light. And the light of the world dies in three hours of darkness as the Lamb of God. <clears throat> but here's the main thought I want us to close with. John has this wonderful expression I must decrease, he must increase. And for people to lose popularity and to point people beyond themselves to someone else is hard to do as a human being. It's hard for some politicians to let go of their office. Uh, it's hard for some coaches to let go of, of their team. And the idea that you are here for the benefit primarily of someone else is to be one of the great hallmarks of John. But just think about that. What would our world be like and what would our church be like if more of us were a voice crying in a wilderness of sin and darkness today for the Lord? But rather than being about us, it's about him. And I think of this with my hands this way. John is saying, I must decrease. And in one sense, this is going to be in terms of the number of his disciples, because they are called that in these early sections. Oh, he was a disciple. He's a follower of John. And John is saying, can I say literally, I must decrease in number because I'm not here for me. I'm here to prepare the way for the Lord. And so in numbers, he is going to decrease. But also in influence. And this is why, I'm, and we've been looking at this, touching on this some on, on Monday night. I'm positive a year before the cross when Jesus starts saying, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and Luke will say, daily and follow me. <laughs> the apostles are scratching their head and thinking, we've been with him for two years, two and a half years, and all of a sudden he starts talking about dying, and he starts talking about carrying a cross, and initially it just would have no idea at all. If you would come after me, do what? Deny yourself. Then take up your cross and follow me. And in spirit and in life, John the Baptist was doing the same thing. Yes, he's before the cross, but his whole existence wasn't for himself. His whole existence was for Jesus. The first guy I worked with was a fabulous guy, great bedside manner. <clears throat> and... Also very, very funny. He, ladies, do you remember in the 60s, kind of use the word beehive, and you know what I'm talking about. The, the hairdos all kind of went, went way up. And there was a lovely lady in the church, and he just asked her one day, he said, why do you wear your hair that way? <laughs> and she said, because my husband likes it that way. And he says, oh, good. And you think, in our lives, if our primary purpose is Jesus likes it that way, 
and that's the purpose of our lives. John is this voice in the wilderness encouraging us today that in our personal lives, we decrease so that he may increase. And look at the last word. This joy of mine is complete. And like the bridegroom who goes and gets the bride, who gets the wedding started, he's thrilled to death when the bride and the groom come together. Nothing can be a greater joy today than for people in darkness to come to the Lord. And let's be that voice crying in the wilderness today. And in our personal lives, may we decrease me in order that he may increase in our personal lives. Have a blessed day today.